A very warm welcome to you, uh, whoever you are, wherever you're joining us from, uh, for this service from uh, Rothley Parish Church. And uh, in our time together this morning, um, even though we're beginning to see just perhaps the glimpses of the way forwards uh, from this whole COVID crisis, we want to lift our eyes above the immediate crisis to focus on our Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, we've been following through Mark's Gospel and praying that each day, week by week, uh, Jesus will, as it were, walk off the pages of the text into our lives, that we might know him and follow him more closely. Uh, this Sunday is, of course, the first Sunday of Lent, and that's a time when we remember um, that our Lord spent 40 days in the wilderness, um, being tempted by the devil. And we read, Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, left the Jordan after his baptism, and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, where for 40 days he was tempted by the devil. And our first hymn uh, is a traditional one which picks up that theme, um, helps us focus on what those 40 days would have meant for Jesus, but also on uh, the challenges for us in our lives as we seek to follow him. So let's sing this together. Him finishes with a lovely thought as we look ahead to Easter that we might hear our Saviour's voice and uh, he might keep us constant uh, at his side. Well let's pray. Almighty God, whose Son Jesus Christ fasted 40 days in the wilderness and was tempted as we are, yet without sin, give us grace to discipline ourselves in obedience to your spirit and as we as you know our weakness so may we know your power to save through jesus christ our lord amen and uh, in our weakness it's right that we come before our lord um, as we come to worship um, in penitence and faith recognizing our weakness and uh, seeking the Lord's mercy and compassion. And Psalm 51 uh, gives us some great words to use as we come before God in this respect. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love, according to your great compassion, blot out my transgression. 
Wash away all my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Against you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. Christ, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Almighty and everlasting God, you hate nothing that you have made, and forgive the sins of all those who are penitent. Create and make in us new and contrite hearts that we, worthily lamenting our sins and acknowledging our wretchedness, may receive from you, the God of all mercy, perfect remission and forgiveness, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And during this time of Lent, um, we're inviting you to join with us in following what we call one of the servant songs, a passage in Isaiah, which speaks of um, the Lord Jesus and his suffering on behalf of our sin, such that we might be able to confess our sins in the way that we just have, with confidence, knowing that uh, God promises to forgive us. And the whole, whole emphasis of this uh, time of Lent is to come and see, to lift our eyes uh, to the cross where Jesus died for us. And so our next hymn invites us to do just that. Come and see, come and see the King of love. Um, we worship at his feet. Um, where wrath and mercy meet, God's judgment and his mercy falling on Jesus on the cross. And let's focus on him as we sing this together.
in our services. We're seeking to uh, share something of the experience of being a Christian during this time of lockdown. And earlier this week, I met with uh, one of our church family, uh, Margaret, and we're now going to hear from her. Well, Margaret, thank you very much for joining us this morning. It's uh, good to see you. Um, can you tell us just a little bit how you are and uh, what you've been doing during this period of lockdown? Well, um, as it happens, I retired last March just before lockdown started. So I went from being really busy. I mean, I only worked um, uh, one and a half days a week. So it was sort of one day, one week, two days, the other week. And I, I was going to the gym and I was, I just always seemed to be rushing, yeah. rushing all the time. And all of a sudden, you know, boom, nothing. Yeah. <laughs> so it was a bit of a shock, actually. It wasn't quite what I thought would happen in retirement. Um, but I mean, overall, I, I do think people like me uh, are really very blessed because, um, you know, if, you, if you've got enough health that you can go for walks, have some exercise, if you've got a garden and you can do your garden, um, you know, all these things are, are such a help. And also having the IT, I mean, that, that's a real blessing because I think being able to keep in touch with people, um, I actually got a, a smartphone just before lockdown again. So, I mean, all these things have really been wonderful for me. Um, and so, you know, keeping in touch with the family and FaceTime and things and, and of course, um, Zoom. Yes, I've got to know how to do that. <laughs> that's yeah. absolutely fantastic. Um, but, you know, I, I think for people that aren't mobile, it, it's just not so easy. And if you're living on your own, you know, I, I think all these things, I really feel that, um, you know, you've, you've interviewed a young mother and a student. And, and I do think life is a lot harder for some of them. And, you know, we're retired. We don't have to worry about job security. Um, we don't have, well, even like yourself, uh, worrying about keeping free of COVID when you're out to work. and seeing people, um, it, it's all these things that, you know, is really taken off our shoulders. So, so what, I mean, what have been your concerns that, um, and what are your hopes um, in the challenges that, uh, that there are for, for you in your situation? Well, I suppose um, uh, Joe is, is affected more than I am because for one thing he's supposed to be shielded but he doesn't drive anyway. So um, when, when he was allowed to go out, uh, he was dependent on me, so he doesn't have his freedom in that way. But almost worse than that, he can't really walk very far. So he doesn't have that huge thing of being able to go for a walk with somebody. I mean, I found going for sort of one-to-one -one walks when that's been allowed. Um, I mean, it's a real good way of meeting people and having a, a good chat. I mean, you know, we try and phone people but it's not the same is it really mm -hmm. um having a sort of relaxed way of uh, talking to people and he used to rely on um going out for lunch with people or having people visit him or he'd visit them i'd maybe take him around to somebody's house or whatever um so i think that's a lot harder for him really and so um, has, has that affected your christian faith this period and uh, those sort of restrictions and, and those opportunities for you to walk? Yes, well, um, as far as uh, things like Bible study and prayer, I've had so much more time. It's been, you know, quite amazing, really. Uh, and I've acquired a study Bible, so that's been great. Um, and I do the, the uh, Facebook um, morning prayers as well. So that's, that's been a real joy. And also things like online conferences. I mean, that, that's been really good. I've, I've been able to um, take part in things I would have never done before. Um, there was this Partners in World Mission conference and there were one or two others, um, you know, and keeping in touch with people overseas. And um, I joined the Diocesan Evangelical Fellowship and joined in one of their conferences. I mean, all, all these things are sort of new to me and um, it's really, really good. But I think that the house group has really been my main um, uh, fellowship and strength, really, because we've been meeting on Zoom every week. 
um, and either alternate weeks study and alternate weeks uh, um, time of prayer for each other. But we've always had a, a chance to share our concerns about our families or what's going on in our lives and to have a time of praying for each other. And you just know that there's that group of people that are there with you. And I think being able to, I mean, I've always found um, group Bible study really helpful, being able to discuss um, ideas and things with different people and uh, look at the Bible together. I think that's always really been very good. And I think I've just had more time. So in a way, that, that's been very good, yes. Yeah, and so uh, I mean, in in that, how, how have you seen God at work, and what would you like us to be praying for you and uh, and for Joe? Well, I suppose as far as God being at work, I would say I've been learning to trust Him more. Maybe um, I've always been very much um, planning things and used to being a little bit in control and. <laughs> You know, keeping the diary organized, you know, and, uh, and and I've had to learn to slow down and also to rely on him for guidance. I mean, there's a phrase that you sometimes use in the morning prayer. Um, the night is past and the day lies open before us. And you sort of sit before God and think, well, what do you want me to do with this day? It could be anything. You know, I've not got to do anything special. Um, so what is it I should be doing? Um, but then for prayer, I think probably, I mean, there is the physical side because you do worry people of our age do go into hospital for various things. I mean, it doesn't have to be COVID. Um, you know, people become ill. And it's the idea of not being able to visit people. I mean, a friend of mine died recently and... Uh, you know, that was really sad, not being able to visit her and her family being so restricted and really hard just to find out really what's going on and, and how sick is she and yeah. um, really difficult. And, and just the thought of supposing, you know, Joe or one of our other friends had to go into hospital and we couldn't keep in touch and, and um, give them the support they needed. Um, so that's a physical side. And I think the mental side as well, um, Fortunately, I'm not someone that usually gets depressed, but you do have your moments of feeling a bit low. You get anxious. I think you do get anxious. Things go around in your head when you're not busy. Yeah. And I do get worried about the family and, you know, they have huge pressures, um, schooling their children and trying to work at the same time. And um, the other families, both in healthcare and, uh, you know, they're terribly under pressure. Um, so, that, that anxiety can, can be, uh, you know, something that we just have to put into God's hands, really. Yeah. Um, but it's also the motivation every day. I mean, I, I sometimes talk to my other friends and we've all said the same thing, you know, to begin with. Oh, our houses were never cleaner, you know. <laughs> and now it's sort of, oh, gosh, what should I do today? <laughs> you know, really, I've got so many things I ought to be doing, but I just can't, you know, it, it just one of the... <laughs> <laughs> I think, you know, that we don't waste this time. I mean, that, that, that is a prayer, that, that we do what God wants us to do and that we know what it is that he's asking of us um, and how we can still serve him, even though we're in our houses, in our right. bubble. <laughs> OK, well, thanks. Thanks very much for sharing that. And I'm sure what you're saying will actually strike a chord with lots of other people um, the spend a lot of time at home and so on in that in that respect and um, so we will be praying for you and um, and just want to thank you for sharing that with us and spending this time with us this morning thanks very much well that was really encouraging to hear from Margaret both uh, the joys and the challenges and it's really important that we continue to pray for one another during these times in just a moment, Fred and Liz are going to lead us in our prayers. But before that, Mill is going to read us our Bible reading from Mark's Gospel. The reading is taken from Mark chapter 10, verses 32 to 45. They were on their way up to Jerusalem, with Jesus leading the way, and the disciples were astonished, while those who followed were afraid. Again, he took the twelve aside and told them what was going to happen to him. We are going up to Jerusalem, 
he said, and the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and the teachers of the law. They will condemn him to death and will hand him over to the Gentiles who will mock him and spit on him, flog him and kill him. Three days later, he will rise. Then James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to him. Teacher, they said, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. What do you want me to do for you? He asked. They replied, let one of us sit at your right and the other at your left in glory. You don't know what you're asking, Jesus said. Can you drink the cup I drink or be baptised with the baptism I am baptised with? We can, they answered. Jesus said to them, you will drink the cup I drink and be baptised with the baptism I am baptised with, but to sit at my right or left is not for me to grant. These places belong to those for whom they have been prepared. When the ten heard about this, they became indignant with James and John. Jesus called them together and said, You know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant, and whoever wants to be first must be slave over all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. As the days lengthen, and the earth spends longer in the light of day, may we spend longer in the light of your presence, O Lord. May the seeds of your words, which have been long buried within us, grow, like everything around us, into love for you and love for others, a visible declaration of your Lordship in our lives. Grant, Lord, that there may be a springtime in our lives this Lent. Amen. Jesus said, The Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is on me, because the Lord has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the broken-hearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives and release from darkness for the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favour. Lord God, we want to praise you for the gifts of intellect and expertise which have allowed scientists and medics to develop the vaccines to fight uh, COVID-19 so quickly. We also want to thank you for the freedom to meet others, to worship together and to do so many other things which have been, pre been prevented over the last year, which we will soon be able to resume. Amen. Lord God, who has promised the release from darkness for prisoners, this week we have been challenged by the news of the apparent imprisonment of Princess Latifah in Dubai. We've heard of the Uyghur being kept in camps to re-educate them in China. We've heard of Aung San Suu Kyi being put under house arrest. On Tuesday it was Holocaust Remembrance Day and there were harrowing tales of the concentration camps where the Jews were imprisoned during the Second World War. Lord, at this time our hearts break knowing that so many are imprisoned, are in captivity, are held because of their beliefs, because of their faith because of the desire by people in power to hold on to that power. Lord, we ask for an outpouring of your spirit, that, Lord, people will learn to give others freedom, to not be so frightened that they want to lock people away 
because of their own insecurities, despite the fact they hold power. Lord, we just pray these things in the name of Jesus Christ, who came to proclaim freedom to the captives. Amen. Lord God, who answered Solomon when he asked for wisdom in governing your people, we pray for those of our government and the medics and the scientific advisors as they draw up plans for the release of lockdown and the restrictions we have all been faced with. Lord, there are competing desires to be free of them, but at the same time, Lord, the need that we wouldn't start to spread the disease again as we've seen over the last few months. So we pray that you would give that sort of wisdom and discernment to our leaders, that they would only do the right thing, that the de release will come at the right time, not just because we all want it tomorrow. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Dear Lord, we bring before you those in special need of our prayers, including those who are ill in body, mind or spirit, those who care for them, and those who have recently been bereaved. May they know your presence and peace in their lives. Gathering all our prayers together, we join together with the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father in heaven, Hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Let's begin with a word of prayer. Lord, we ask very simply in the next few minutes that your Holy Spirit in this season of Lent will enable us to dig a little more deeply into the nature and extent of your wonderful love for each one of us. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, as I've just mentioned, we're now in the church's season of Lent, the period between Ash Wednesday and Easter Sunday. This year our Lent book, which is this, The Beauty of the Cross by Tim Chester, helps us to focus in some depth on the Saviour who died as a ransom for all who put their trust in him. Now details of both the book and Rob's accompanying weekly YouTube talks throughout Lent are available both on the Fellowship Post and on the Church website. As we look towards the celebration of Easter, I wonder what goes through your mind when you think of Good Friday and the crucifixion of Jesus. Perhaps well-known Easter hymns like There is a green hill far away or When I survey the wondrous cross <clears throat> perhaps a picture of the cross, reminding you of the sorrow and suffering of Jesus. Perhaps an image of the crowds at the foot of the cross, some mocking Jesus, some in tears. There are many, many different possibilities. Our passage today from Mark chapter 10 is the third time that Jesus... <coughs> that Jesus has warned his disciples about what is going to happen to him. And it very much echoes Isaiah's prophecy some 800 years before Jesus of an, of an anointed messianic figure who would suffer and die for the sins of Israel and indeed the world. At the end of our passage today from Mark 10, Jesus' words hark back to the suffering servant's redeeming death so graf graphically predicted in Isaiah 53 verses 5 and 6, where we read, But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we are healed. We all like sheep have gone astray. 
Each one of us has turned to our own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. These verses from Isaiah 53 are central to today's theme, which is Jesus, a ransom for many. Jesus' disciples couldn't comprehend the reason why he was heading to Jerusalem and heading to the cross with such utter determination. Indeed, many people in the early centuries, as well as in our own day, have found it incredible that Jesus could have thought about his own death in such a deliberate and focused way. They've tried telling the story of Jesus without the central importance of the cross. But Jesus' own words on the subject have always been at the very core of authentic Christianity. In verse 45, Jesus makes a promise no other religious leader in the world has ever made or could make. We read this, For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. And in saying this, he declares for all to see what he came to earth to do. He came to save you and me and all who put their faith in him. He did not come simply as an example of how to live well, as some have argued and still argue today. No, he didn't come in that context, but he came as our ransom. And there's, there's a huge difference between example and ransom. And it's of fundamental importance. On the cross, he completely paid the price for all our failures, our sins. And that's what Good Friday was all about. Death on the cross was a ransom Jesus paid to enable all who follow him to know God's forgiveness and love, both now and for all eternity. And all this was foretold by the prophet Isaiah 800 years earlier. Now James and John had been with Jesus from the very beginning of his public ministry, but today's passage shows that they were very flaky indeed about the central points of his ministry. To be honest, a bit like us on occasions. But my friends, the good news is that not completely knowing and not completely understanding every jot and tittle of Christian doctrine does not in itself disqualify us from the ranks of those who follow Jesus. No, we don't need a PhD in theology to follow Jesus. We don't need a certificate of authorization signed by the bishop. No, what we do need is a love for Jesus, which is rooted in his love for us and demonstrated so clearly on the cross. Essentially, ours is a simple, uncomplicated faith, although it, it seems at times that every effort is being made to overcomplicate it. Beware. In our passage, James and John approach Jesus with a demand, which is nothing short of a bid for glory. They were after the highest possible positions of status in this power grab when Jesus eventually takes his place as king. Yet they've no idea what they're asking. They fail to understand that this is not what the kingdom is about. But interestingly, Jesus does not despise them for their ignorance. No, he recognises that people have to come to the realisation of who he is and what he is about in their own time and be open to God's leading. So in verses 38 to 40, he gives James and John a cryptic answer, which reveals their ambitious bravado once again. Now, needless to say, the other disciples weren't impressed at all. In fact, they were furious at James and John. Verse 41, we read, when the 10 heard about this, they became indignant with James and John. Why? I wonder, were they so furious? Is their fury because they were nearly outflanked by the two brothers and nearly lost out on their own places of status? 
Or is it because they see more clearly that the disciples belong together and that they must refrain from selfish ambition within the group? Well, we can't be sure. However, we can be sure that when Jesus had finished with them, they were certainly chastened. Jesus doesn't pull his punches in verses 42 to 45. He emphasises that in the kingdom of God, all are servants and greatness is to be found in generous self-giving for the sake of others. Many examples of which we've seen in this village and further afield during the pandemic. Humility rather than power or status is the name of the game. God is not impressed one little bit by our pursuit of power and status. And we need to remember that. All of us need to remember that. The truth is that Jesus is going up to Jerusalem, turning the world's values and power systems on their heads. He is setting off to give his life as a ransom for many. If we want to receive what he has to offer, we have no choice but to follow. Let me end with some words from 19th century theologian Bishop J.C. Ryle, who said this. Let all who trust in Christ take comfort in the thought that they build on a sure foundation. It is true that we are, we are sinners, but Christ has borne our sins. It is true that we are poor, helpless debtors, but Christ has paid our debts. Thanks be to God, Christ has paid a full and complete ransom for us. He continues, the door is wide open, the prisoners may go free. May we all know this privilege by heartfelt experience and walk in the blessed liberty of the children of God. Well, what a wonderful quote that is. And during this season of Lent and in the challenging days which inevitably will lie ahead. Let's all hold fast to that wonderful promise, the promise of the one who gave his life, not simply as an example, but as a ransom for all who turn to him in penitence and faith. Amen. The Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Our final hymn reminds us that Jesus is indeed our servant king. Let's sing this hymn together. From heaven you came, helpless babe, entered our world, your glory veiled, not to be served, but to serve, and give your life that we might live.
Well, as we close our service and uh, look ahead into the week, uh, I know for some time the government have been indicating that uh, tomorrow the Prime Minister would be making an announcement to uh, review the conditions of the lockdown. We don't, we don't know what's going to be said and how that's going to play out and how it will translate locally. Um, but if there are any significant changes, uh, we will, of course, update you. But in the meantime, uh, we do hope you'll be able to join us uh, online for our service next Sunday. Um, as I said earlier, this is Lent, and um, we are encouraging people to read this book, The Beauty of the Cross, by Tim Chester, just a little section each day to help us focus on Jesus and his suffering for us. And each Wednesday evening, and there's going to be just a short talk uh, on our church website, which ties in with that theme. So do please look out for that. Um, lock lockdown has been difficult. Um, but as uh, Hebrews chapter 10 reminds us, let us encourage one another all the more, even as we see the day approaching. Now, of course, the day isn't just the day of lockdown. The day is the day when our Lord Jesus uh, will return in glory. Um, but let's encourage one another, uh, be in touch with one another, speak to one another by phone, by social media, um, engage with the service on Facebook as well. Uh, it would be good to hear from you all and to see you being in touch with each other. A closing prayer. Almighty God, you have given your only Son to be for us both a sacrifice for sin and also an example of godly life. Give us grace that we may most thankfully receive these his inestimable gifts and also daily endeavour to follow the blessed steps of his most holy life. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.